Hi, I put together a little tutorial regarding Panzer's solo rules that were first produced in Module 4, um, the French, which introduced the French unit into the Panzer um, family. And in that, they introduced a solo set of rules um, that allows you to play solo with some very good granularity to the game. Um, with very little sacrifice to the actual playability of a two-person version of scenarios with with that game. So what I want to do is try to give you a little introduction as to what it looks like and um, how it works. Um, I'm not going to go through the rules in depth in terms of in terms of it, but I'm actually going to play it. And, and as things come up, I will actually show you what goes on and um, how it works uh, with this, because I think you'll find that'll be the quickest way of getting a quick understanding. It doesn't surpass actually going back and reading through the rules and kind of digesting them yourself, but it just kind of gives you an idea of what it is all about and get you a little excited for it maybe and um, see how good it is, because I've really found it quite enjoyable to, uh, to play this way. So what I'm going to do is show you uh, this scenario. It's uh, scenario 36S, or S36, excuse me. And um, it is uh, actually downloadable from Board Game Geek. Um, it was put up there. It wasn't part of the original uh, package that was out. There's two solo scenarios in there, which are wonderful to play. Um, I just like this one. This one's a really good scenario, which shows a lot of early German and French armor that um, that clash here in Belgium, uh, as you can see here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to play the whole scenario here. Um, I've actually got it set up where they're going to be close to meeting each other, so it kind of eliminates some of the less interesting parts. And... Um, gets into some of the mechanics of of the whole thing. I'm only going to play about three or four, maybe five turns, depending on how exciting it gets uh, towards the towards the end of it. And uh, just kind of show you the mechanics and show you what I feel is really the excitement behind the uh, the solo rules um, with this. So, um, like I said, this scenario is downloadable um, from Board Game Beep. I'll put the put a link into the video um, so that you can see it here. Uh, but I'll just kind of walk through it, because if you've played the Panzer before, you know what these scenario cards look like and um, how they actually work. So I'm not going to go through them in detail. But it's basically the same one as scenarios um, one and two of the uh, French module. And uh, the only difference is that it's using these solo rules. So there's a lot more special conditions that we will... Um, we'll go into as we as we need to. A um, couple things I just want to highlight here. First is um, um, just what the uh, solo uh, setup looks like for the units. So with the units, you are actually playing the German force. Um, that's considered the friendly force. All right, that force is going to be what uh, you're under control of and, and what you're working with. And they'll work just the same way, same mechanics as Panzer does. The French, down here, will be the enemy force. And um, it's a little bit different than somebody sitting across the table from you. Here we actually have representations of just what the same units are in the scenario in the original scenario except now they're going to be randomly generated as needed um, as part of the uh, as part of the unveiling of the scenario and how things go and that's one of the things that's really interesting about it too because this unveils the units as you go so you don't know what's actually going on here a lot of other games do that as well um, but this is, is kind of nice here because it's it's really dependent upon some of the mechanics that are already in the game such as spotting so that really becomes key in here. I think you'll find with other scenarios that recon units really become quite, quite useful um, in terms of what they're, uh, what they're supposed to do. But I just want to highlight here a couple of different things here. First off, up here on the top, um, you see you've got your normal, you know, who they are. Uh, you also have uh, that they're seasoned, excellent. The CP value if you're using uh, morale. Now, I'm not going to use morale. I highly suggest using morale if you, if you are... Uh, playing the, the whole game and many of the advanced rules, I will also say, should be included um, to really get some good flavor out of the game. Uh, the two new things here are the activation modifier, minus five, and cautious. 
these are basically going to be used in a couple different aspects to um, figure out how many units are going to be appearing as well as what their stance is going to be in terms of their activity and what type of orders they're going to get over here. Then we have our unit representations and you'll notice they're slightly different. You'll see uh, two sets of numbers. One, there's a um, there's a, uh, a range number here, 0, 01, 0, 08, 0, 09, 0, 42, or 42, uh, and then you see 26, 27. 26, 27, those are just your victory point, um, your point values. Uh, but the range numbers are going to be the ranges when you try to uh, see if the unit appears, you know, what type of unit. And you notice that they're all the ranges are going to be bracketed between 0, 01 and 0, 0. Basically, your 2, 2d10 dice rolls. Um, that we're all comfortable with within regular Panzer. And you see those are all bracketed within here to figure out what units are actually going to appear. So those are the those are the big things that are a little bit different. Everything else is the same and we don't actually have any setup of the French units. They're all going to be hidden. So hidden rules are going to be key uh, as part of this, which are, are actually very good. But we'll see that as we as we get into this here as well. Okay, so this is uh, this is the scenario where we're that we're going to have um, on here. Now, let me just jump over to our actual setup here. I'm actually playing this with Vassal, uh, so that we can, uh, so I can record this uh, a little bit easier. I'd, I'd like to do it via camera, but on the real stuff. But uh, Vassal will will work a little bit better in this case. And here, I've just got a snippet of that scenario that I was telling you about. So here, this is probably half the. Um, or maybe even a third of the boards uh, that you use um, within here, because we're only going to be using from this path line here, in the middle of the board, to the right. I'm not going to use the left half of the board. And you notice I've excluded one of the boards off here as well, because I wanted to get this very focused and get units right into action pretty quick um, as we play through it. So let me just highlight a few things here first. First off, let me zoom in here just a little bit so you can see. And I'll start off with the German units. Now here, I don't have the full complement. I've only used um, basically three Panzer um, three Fs, as well as three uh, SPW 251 ones, affectionately known as the Hannah uh, They will be loaded with uh, three infantry squads over here. Nothing special about them, just regular infantry squads. They don't have any special weapons or anything like that. They're just rifle rifle units. So they're loaded coming in from the north. Uh, then we have our victory point um, hexes over here. I'll just highlight this for you. Uh, right around here. All right, basically the town of Eist uh, is set up right here. So that's going to be the victory points for both um, units, or both sides. Then down here at the bottom, you'll notice we've got some hidden units. That's all of these guys over here right, that have already come on the board and already moved up. So we're pretty close in terms of having first contact with uh, with the units and actually starting to, to, to fight a little bit uh, for the town. So um, those are the different setups over here. Now at this point, a uh, couple things to note, let me just zoom out once more, um, is that the units themselves are all not spotted at this point. In other words, uh, the French cannot see the Germans and the Germans can't see that, see them um, over here. Uh, they're blocked either by the um, the uh, hill town angle here, or the um, hedgerow right here will block them all across uh, this side. Remember, in Panzer, hedgerows count as a level one obstruction, so that's going to block this uh, line of sight for them across here. So right now, not seeing anything. Uh, nobody sees anybody. Um, they're both moving towards uh, the town itself. Both want to occupy this uh, this piece of ground right here uh, for this. So that's the setup I'm going to have. Like I said, I'm going to play about four or five turns um, with this and um, you know, hopefully show you how it goes um, with this. 
Now, one other point I want to bring up um, is actually with uh, the rules. Uh, let me go over here. Uh, okay. Um, in the Panzer IV expansion, uh, France 1940, uh, we do have the solo rules. Uh, like I said, they do they are worth reading through in detail, playing out yourself. But one of the most important things is at the back, the solitaire tables. Um, these are what we're going to use to control a lot of the aspects of what the French are doing in terms of um, activations, commands, how they attack, when they attack, uh, when they appear, where do they appear, um, how they move, uh, just pretty much everything um, on here. Now, one of the first ones I will alert you to here is this maximum firing range. This is the maximum range that the French will fire at uh, the German units, your German, your German units on there. So in this case, they were seasoned, remember? So they will fire at a medium range. So um, all hidden units will hold their fire, even if they've got a spot on you for long range and extreme range. Um, it won't be until they're medium or less that they will start shooting. Okay. Now, once they appear, and they actually get on the board, uh, then it's a little bit different because then um, with shooting, it then now becomes up to the fire action table over here, which we'll discuss later in terms of how they will engage and um, and um, how that will work uh, work for you there as well. But this is important, uh, seeing as we're not quite there meeting each other, but um, it will be important in terms of um, how we're maneuvering and how we're maneuvering around over there. Okay. Um, the other thing to remember here is this attitude modifier too. This this a lot of pluses and minuses here for commands and um, fire and move actions over here. Now we will not be using the defend command table. Um, these are the two things that give us our commands because the the um, French are technically on the attack, so they will be using the attack table or over here for their commands. Okay. So I've got my other rules up here as well. And uh, going back over to the board, I think we're all set to go. Um, just a couple other notes. I will be describing what's going on here. Um, I am human, uh, not perfect. May make a sick mistake on here. Please feel free to call me out in the um, comments below. Um, once we're all said and done, that's perfectly fine. If I do come to a point which I've got a question, I will probably pause the video and um, go look it up and then come back and explain it to you and then go from there. So um, hopefully try to keep these as brief as, as possible, but there we have it. So I'm back with turn one here and um, turn one is going to be pretty, pretty basic uh, due to the fact that we're still kind of moving towards engagement. We have not engaged yet, but both sides are still moving towards engagement, but this will help highlight and give some, focus on some of the some of the simpler uh, rules that will apply as well as the changes to the um, sequence of play. So let me start off and highlight um, what's going to be happening here. Let me pull up the sequence of play chart on here. And um, sequence of play is going to be the same as what we've had before with some modifications to it. Now the first three uh, phases, the spotting, command, and initiative, um, we'll see a little bit of change, not too much, and you'll see it kind of flows in there as well. So I'm gonna go through those first three phases um, to get started here, and then we'll get into the combat and everything like that. So first phase is spotting. So with the spotting phase, um, as I said before, uh, we're pretty much unspotted at the moment. I don't see the French, and the French don't see me at this point. Remember, the um, hedgerow here is a level one obstacle, so uh, that blocks our view for now. So, um, pretty straightforward. Spotting phase is complete. There's no changes markers or anything like that. And you'll see as we get into the other turns, you'll see there's very little change to that phase as well. The next phase, the command phase, um, we're gonna see a little start to see a little bit of the changes. Uh, the first thing is the fact that um, I will pick my commands for the German units up here. Uh, and then we will use the scripted version to select commands for 
the French down here. And we'll also have some special rules coming from the scenario itself for this as well. So um, that will um, that will have some effect on us uh, as well. So I'm also going to be using the um, the available commands uh, rules. So in this case, I have um, I have the um, Germans. Um, I have nine units. I have the three Panzer threes, three Fs, the Hanamags, three of those, and then also three rifle units. So that gives me a total of nine units. Um, so I cross-reference the nine over here, and I look down across my seasoned chart, and I see that there are five commands that I can use. Okay, that's great. Now, I'm also going to be using shared commands, so my command setup is going to be pretty easy this first turn. Get the game pieces up here. Um, I'm just going to take the um, Panzer III uh, Fs are going to share a command. All three of those are going to stay at a, kind of a pl platoon command. Uh, they'll all share the move. And then the same thing with the Henemags and, of course, the rifles that are on them as well. They're going to share a move marker as well. So I've only used two. I really like the the um, available command uh, or rule there and sharing commands. That gives a lot more flexibility to um, to our units, I think, in terms of either keeping them together, keeping a tight command, or being a little bit more flexible um, with them as well. So then uh, that makes the German commands pretty much set and done. Now I'm going to dive into, and this is where it gets a little bit more complex, to the uh, French. Now with the solo rules, typically that will require us to use the um, chart, um, I'm gonna pay, go to the bottom here, there we go, um, use our chart to uh, to dice for the, the commands over here. All right, and uh, as I had said in the intro, um, I will be using this as we go on here, but we also have one other thing in the scenario instructions is the fact that this, it says here under the special conditions, French hidden units roll on the command table if at 10 hexes or less from the nearest German unit until then French hidden units uh, receive move commands. So that makes it pretty straightforward for us. We're going to use the, the move command um, within there because they're not within 10. If we take a look at the closest units here, if I do a quick line of sight, um, they are at 11 um, at best. Okay, so right now everybody's going to have a move. Now in the next turn, we're obviously going to close in terms of our range, and you know we'll be within the 10, um, 10 hex rules. Um, I've also experimented with this as well, just kind of as a side note here, um, to extend that 10, uh, extend that move um, rule um, to when they're spotted as well, um, which I find that's that works very well as well because as you'll see with this setup, that the um, that the units most likely will still not spot each other after this first turn. Um, and um, then you know, it starts rolling for them and we start getting random moves on there, which, which the random moves work well most of the time, but I would also use your discretion as it seems to be away from the narrative of what's trying to happen for the battle. You know, if you've got some outlier to say that, you know, one of these units is, is that's, that's way down here at the bottom or way out of range and not have any um, you know, capability of, of seeing or hitting or doing anything with them. All of a sudden they're digging in. Um, you know, use your discretion whether they should still use a move or a fire or something like that um, uh, with this. So even though the rules for um, the solo rules for command assignment are generally good, um, again, use your discretion as it seems right for the narrative that you're trying to trying to have with the game. So in this case, all of these units are going to have moves. Um, I'm just gonna keep this simple in terms of how I'm gonna mark this. I'm just gonna put a single move command down here just to, just to give a reference, but it's basically all my units here are going to be moving, uh, or all the French units are going to be moving um, as part of, uh, part of this for now. Okay, so there's our command assignments. Um, so that takes care of uh, uh, that uh, first two phases, command phase and spotting phase. Now the initiative. 
now this is where we really see a big change um, come in here because initiative is different now you notice in the two-player game both players roll dice see who uh, gets the higher dice and they get the initiative obviously you can't have two players uh, rolling dice within here as well and that's where the command rules come in with a solution in here you'll notice that there is an enemy initiative rating uh, based upon the grade that they're at. So whatever grade they're at, and the French are at seasoned, the initiative rating is 50. That is basically the French roll. Um, they will roll 50 all the time. And you, as the German, will still roll, and you need to beat that. If you get higher than 50, you've got the initiative. If you get lower than 50, then the French have the initiative. All right. So that's you know a pretty nice and you know approximate way of looking at it. You know the more um, experienced your enemy is, um, the better the chance that he's going to get the advantage over you. Um, the the less experienced they are, the more chance you're going to get the initiative over them. Okay. So that's that's how that works. Now we also have a scenario rule here, and this is where I said there's a lot of scenario rules. Um, when determining the initiative, the German force applies a plus 10 DRM. So I'm actually going to get a plus 10 DRM to the dice roll. So I really need to just roll a, a 41 or higher, and I will get the initiative. Anything below 41, it's over to the, to the French. So let's go back to our vassal, and I'm going to do my um, D100 here, or my two D10s, to see what the initiative is. So my initiative here is 71, plus 10 makes 81. I obviously have the, the initiative. Okay, so I can actually choose who's the first player and who's the, um, the second player uh, in terms of going first and second. Now, in this case, um, we still haven't seen each other. There's no firing, so there's going to be no advantage in terms of who goes first for the firing. Um, in terms of the movement, uh, we're still both far enough away that it's going to take two turns to actually get to the, um, the town. So there's really no advantage at this point. So I'm going to take the second player just because I want to move first. Um, it's really, again, not going to have much effect. Um, but I'm going to move him, get the Germans in place, and then we will go and... Um, work on the uh, the French because the French will have again the scripted dice rolling um, movement to get them into the town okay so let me go ahead here um, so what I'm gonna do here is just move my movement off of here for a moment and um, start moving these uh, moving these forward I'm gonna actually zoom in here a little bit so that we can see the units now the pans are Three Fs have a movement of off-road movement of four or a track movement of four. Um, so these guys are just going to rumble forward. One, two, three, four. So there. All right. And um, I'm also going to set them up. Uh, well, it really doesn't matter at this point. Yeah, that's that's fine. I'm going to leave them pointed, pointed south just in case one of these French somehow get... Uh, get around the corner and we get spotting on them and then the next one's going to do the same thing one two three four and one two three four to there okay so they moved from from there uh into into there as well so they're keeping my front arc facing the french to some degree here as well all right um then we will move my hand eggs um they also have a movement of four, half track movement of four. They'll go one, two, three, and four, and the same thing again. I'm just going to move them all down. And there we have it. All right. So they've moved um, forward. Um, I like how these nice spotting markers show up over here. That's very nice. So now it's on to the French. Now, a couple things with the French. Remember I said they're, they're aiming for the town as well. Both of our objectors are this nice uh, fat town of, of victory points right here. So they're moving, they're going to be moving in this general direction in terms of their movement. But in terms of how they move, is really going to be dictated by the solo uh, script here. So let's take a quick look at that. 
Uh, we're going to go over here in terms of the movement chart. Now, a couple of things. Um, we do have modifiers. So you have these attitude modifiers for both the, the command table when we roll on it, fire action, movement action, and route. Um, we're going to concentrate on the movement action and the route uh, action. So there's the uh, French are cautious, so they're going to get a minus 10 and a minus 1 for, um, for their movement and the route that they take. So now we're going to come down here to our movement actions. And um, here is where we're actually going to roll. Per each hex, hidden unit hex, we are going to um, roll on here to see which direction that they actually take or how they take the directions. Now you'll notice there's different directions here. Greatest cover hex, nearest victory point hex, highest um, value victory point hex, most dangerous friendly unit, nearest friendly unit. Now in this little short video, it's actually going to, some of these are actually going to be the same. Things like the nearest victory hex and the highest victory, highest value victory hex are going to be essentially the same because we only have one, right? And all of them um, share it. We've got to get basically five town hexes to, to claim the victory hexes over there. So these two things are going to be the same um, over here. Uh, greatest cover, um, not quite self-explanatory because that is either going towards something that gives you great cover, a negative DRM uh, in terms of firing, or the most negative spotting DRM. So in there, things like fields and um, brush and things like that will also get that benefit as well. So moving into those or moving towards those uh, count towards greatest cover. It's not just cover from fire, it's cover from um, spotting as well. And then units, um, it's, it's most dangerous friendly unit or nearest friendly unit. Um, those are a little bit self-explanatory. Most dangerous unit um, is, is basically one that has the greatest chance of you know, knocking out one of the, one of the French units. Um, and you notice there's a little sub, uh, superscript uh, up there. Um, most dangerous friendly units within spotting range. Um, that's one of the most important things. And if there isn't anyone within the spotting range, then it reverts to the nearest friendly unit. Um, that one's self-explanatory. That's just one that's the closest in hexes to uh, to that unit. Okay, so this is going to dictate, you know, in terms of where we're going. Most likely, we're going to be going towards the town. That's the highest percentage within here. But you may have some slight deviations for some reason. Sometimes the platoon commanders get lost. Sometimes they don't receive the orders properly. Sometimes they're just scared. Um, who knows? Um, so it gives a little bit of variability to the movement. It's not just going to be, you know, marching right up to the town. There could be some variable movement in there. And then the other the other aspect of our movement is going to be this route table. Uh, the route table is the table that shows us what type of direction that they will take. There's basically three directions, safest, fastest, and direct. Safest means taking advantage of cover and lack of spotting by the friendly forces as possible. Um, it's the safest route. It's going behind the hedges. It's going through um, fields. It's going, um, you know, behind towns and woods and things like that. Um, fastest is going to be uh, the fastest route, which expends the least movement point to get you to the point the quickest possible. So in this case, roads and tracks come into play. If you're on a road or a track and you get fastest, you're going to stay on the road and track and continue towards your um, objective based upon the move action table. Um, you won't go off road, you will, you will stay there. Um, you won't care about cover. Um, you'll care more about speed um, at that point. And then finally is direct, which that's pretty straightforward. You will take a direct line towards your direction that um, was, spot, was specified in the move action table. Um, so that'll be a direct. So you will go straight, you know, in, in best possible form. I mean, obviously with hex, hex sides and things like that, that are 
slightly different. You may need to deviate to the right or the left a little bit, but then you'll you know come back there. It's kind of like sailing, you know, tacking and, and um, coming back on on course. So um, those are the two things that we will roll for each one of our units. So let's come back here and um, start off with the first one here on H9. I'm going to start this guy here. H9. He's in the f he's in this field. All right. So we're going to roll his direction his direction first so it's 24 now remember on our chart we have to subtract 10 so it's actually drops down to a 14 all right so 14 is in greatest cover all right so he's going to go towards greatest cover all right um towards his mission objective which is going to be the the town up here um, but he's going to try to stay within the greatest cover as much as as possible and then his direction, I'm going to roll with uh, the blue dice here. It's going to be a four. Subtracting one makes three. So he's going to take the safest route. So he's going to go greatest cover and safest route. So again, he's going towards the town. All right? And he's got to go with the greatest cover and um, uh, in the safest direction. Now, in this case, pretty much everything, because spotting is very limited. Um, we really can't see, you know, this unit really can't see much. They can see to there. All right. Uh, oh, no, they can't. They're, cu they're cut off there by um, Z7. So they really can't see there. They can't see there. They can see there, uh, but I don't think they can make it there with, in terms of their speed and, and such. So we've really got everything is, is safe over here. Um, it's really going to be more of a case of what's going to be the greatest cover to do that. Now, in this case, um, if we go up uh, ahead, uh, you know, there's still cover over here. You could get behind um, behind this point over here. Uh, he could go a little bit to the left in this direction. Let me actually get a pointer on there, and you know, like this. Um, that leaves him a little bit vulnerable if the tanks came came a little bit farther south there. Um, he could come over here, um, uh, which again uh, leaves him a little bit in the open. Um, he could come over here in this direction um, as well. That kind of takes him away. Uh, we don't want to move away too much because our objective really is here or here. Um, so he really, you know, could go in this direction, staying far away from where units are going. Um, he could come up here as well uh, with this. Now, I should say, um, the units, how do we judge how far they can move? Um, and that comes back to our scenario chart here. And on our scenario chart, if we look down here, for the French units, we have our main unit, which I talked about slightly um, in the introduction here. The main enemy unit here, this is the one that dictates all hidden movement and firing uh, for a given side. So this main enemy unit is the H39. So this is gonna dictate everything, um, how it's spotted, how it fires, how it moves, everything while it's hidden. Now, once it becomes unhidden and, and revealed, then, uh, yeah, obviously, it's going to move as its characteristics, but for now, we're going to dictate on the H39. So the H39 is is going to be the movement points, whatever movement points for the H39 is going to be the movement points for the hidden unit. So let's take a look at the um, card for the H39 here. So let me go over here, go over the French, and we're going to look at the H39. So the H39, that only has a movement of of three on the track side. It has five for the path and seven for the road. Okay, road is probably not going to have an effect on this, but track will. So we may we may use the track over here, um, but for the most part, the um, the off road movement is three. So really, their range is going to be fairly limited on this first turn. It's either up here, or you know over here. Or over here or over here. All right. So here's where you can use your discretion in terms of how you wanna how you wanna make this happen. Um, you know, if you want them here or here or here, it's totally up to you. Now, I think what I'm gonna do is is actually have them come straight up here. 
Um, or actually, no, I'm going to have them actually come to the side just a little bit. All right, off to here. Um, it still puts me within striking range of the town um, within two hexes. This one would also have two hexes here as well. But again, I'd have a log jam over here with, with these guys um, coming up probably. Um, I could come over to X10, right? but that kind of keeps me away from the town. And this is where, you know, the narrative, how you want to strike the, um, the narrative of what you're trying to do here. I want these French, even though they're, even though they're cautious, they're still going for the town. Now they don't know that the Germans are coming at this point. So, you know, they're just moseying along and, you know, thinking they're going to get into the town, set up a defensive position and, and wait from there. So um, at this point, I'm just going to have them move up here. So this guy's going to go one, two, three. And that takes care of him. And he moves up here, closing on the town. Now let's take the guy on the road here, this F, uh, in F9. Let's roll for him. So now we're going to roll for him. He rolls a 43, now subtracting 10, which is going to give us our 33. Now he's going to be moving under 33 to the nearest victory point hex. Okay. The nearest victory point hex. All right. So he, uh, he um, is going to be uh, heading towards the town again and, you know, heading up the, um, the road, uh, possibly up the road here or across country over here to, to get up there. Let's see what his route's going to be. His route's going to be a three minus one is two. And that's going to be the safest. So he's going to go the safest route again. Safety here is a little bit relative. Everything is safe at the moment because he's unspotted. Um, but he's going to come up the safest route. Now, um, I'm actually going to have him come up the road here a little bit. Um, take advantage of the road movement. So he could actually go one, two, three, four, five. All right, still safe because it's, you know, he's behind everything here. He's not going to get spotted coming around the corner because our spotting here, as we said, is going to be blocked by Z7. That takes up the whole hex, not just the not just the building image itself. It's the whole hex. And the same thing here. And then that over there is going to block as well. So everything's pretty much safe. Um, it's going to go for the victory point hex. So I'm going to have him go up here. So he's going to go one two, three, four, and five. And now let's move down the road to the next guy here in E8. And he's going to roll a two minus 10, you know, gives him zero. But that again is going to be moving in greatest cover. Okay. And now here I'm going to roll my direction. He's going to roll a nine minus one is eight. And he's going to move the fastest fastest way. All right, so he's going to go the greatest cover in the fastest method. All right, so now in this case, we got a couple things. He can come up the road, one, two, three, four, five. That's fast. I mean, he's still, the big objective is the, is the um, town. So he could come up here and still be in some decent cover. Um, he'd be behind the hedge a little bit. Um, he could also uh, move up into the the um, the field here, going one, two, three. That's fastest for the for the off track, um, and maybe you know try to set up a flanking maneuver on me. Um, that might not be out of the realm of the narrative. Uh, so he could come up this way. Um, he could be a little bit cautious and say, oh boy, you know I'm not sure if I want to move up there, or maybe I'm going to be a support unit. He could also go one, two. It goes with one, two, three over here um, to set up being a um, supporting unit uh, over here as well. Um, he could move, you know, up behind the the head, the um, hedge here itself, um, just being a little, you know, closing range, but being a little timid there as well. Um, I'm going to set him up here and, and see how this is going to work. I'm going to actually make him a little aggressive and have him go one, two three into the field, um, possibly setting up some sort of flank, flanking defense or flanking attack. 
you know, again, they don't know what's going on here, but it's it's everybody's all moving at kind of the same time. So next one, F8. Uh, so we're going to roll. 63 minus 10 makes 53. So 53 is going to be highest uh, point value hex. So again, he's going to move towards the town. And then he is going to go in the direction of 4, which is going to be minus 1 is 3, the safest route. So he's going to go the safest route here um, to move up towards the sound, town. Um, now, pretty much any route is the safest at this point. Um, we'll set him up to to um, to come over in this direction. That's why he's going to go up one, two, three. So he's closing on the town, still meet the re direction requirement. Um, still safest as well because he's behind everything here. But now he gets a little bit of support, you know, within there. Okay, G7 is next. It rolls a 47, becomes a 37 with a minus 10. And again, that's going to be nearest VP hex. Great. And we're going to roll that. He rolls a 0, minus 1. Um, brings him down to a 9. So he's going to do a, uh, a direct route. Okay, so we haven't seen direct route yet. Um, direct route means that he has to go towards... The victory points. So in this case, you know, we're going to draw a line over here like that. And that's going to be his general route. So he's going to go actually one, two, three. So he's actually going to wind up in with the um, one, two, three. They're going to wind up together there. So we've got two units in there now. Okay. It happens, you know, units are moving. Again, we don't know what's there. There may have been nothing there. So, you know, at this point, the stacking on here really is not relevant um, because, you know, it could be phantom units uh, that we're talking about. All right, let's go with F7. He rolls a 51, becomes a 41. I'm also going to do the, the direction roll as well. It becomes a 4. So we got 41 and a 4. So 41 is nearest VP hex. Four is going to be the safest route. So again, we'll try to angle them here a little bit. We'll make them go up one and two. Oops, two over here and then three over there. All right. Um, this other guy on the road, E6. He gets a 77, comes 67, and he also goes safest. Um, I believe, but let's just come back and look at it. 67, um, highest victory point hex. That's going to be this one. And then he's also going to be safest as well. So um, in this case, we're going to take advantage of the road because he's on there. Everything's pretty much safe for him. Um, he's going to go one, two, three, four, and five. So he's safely behind the, the, um, the hedge. And the last one here, done in G5, we'll do the dice roll here, because 73 becomes a 63, and an 8 becomes a 7. And we will look here, so 63 is going to be highest victory point hex, 7 is going to be fastest. Okay, now this becomes interesting because he's sitting on the road, so technically he could take road movement and go to here at least. Um, but they need to have to stop. Um, now he could also take path movement and go all the way over here and up the path. So it'd be one, two, three, four, five. And then he could also take um, track movement, going cross country, um, moving towards the town and go one, two, three. So now if we look at these here, the three brings them up to this movement hex, the five, one, two, three, four, five, brings them over here to E7. And then the road movement just brings them to D6. Right. Now, um, I'm going to make the judgment call here to, again, force my narrative of going towards the town that he's actually going to take the track movement because that's actually closing the fastest and closest to the town. So they're moving towards the town. I shouldn't say fastest, I should say, probably say closest. Um, 
whereas the path winds them up over here and um, the road brings them back over here. So in this case, you know, closing on the town, it's actually better for them to move one, two, and three right up to that, um, right up to that hex there. I'm just going to move that off a little bit. There we go. Or actually move it up here so I can see it uh, like that. Okay. So that's the movement for the uh, the French units at this point. We, you notice there's still no spotting. Everybody's still unspotted, um, you know, for what they're doing uh, with this. So let's take a look at our sequence of play once again. So we've 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 gone through the combat. There is no combat. Um, then we've gone to the movement. Um, I was the, the the friendly player. The I was the friendly player um, and moved first. Uh, as a second player, and then I move the uh, the, the uh, French as the second player. Uh, then we just have our adjustment phase. Um, this doesn't change too much here. Um, pivot step, nothing yet. Uh, turn adjustment. Um, I have I have no real turn adjustments that I want to do. Now for the French, it doesn't really matter at this point. Um, full cover. Um, not going to go into full cover. This is full cover for me. You'll see with the rules how full cover is, hand cover is handled for the French uh, a little bit later. And then we have um, suppression. Uh, nothing for suppression. No morale. Um, adjust counter steps and, and the turn. Okay. So I'll take off my counters here. I'm going to take off my counters here. Take off the counters here, and you know, in a normal game, I'd move my turn, turn um, counter up. Um, but you know, this is just a playthrough, so we'll uh, we'll just kind of go from there. So that's the end of turn one. So hopefully, this has illustrated uh, basically the some of the simple changes that have been in place here for um, solo rules, showing movement, uh, showing what the friendly and enemy players. Um, do, showing the initiative, and um, going from there. So let me do a little bit of cleanup here with this, and we'll come back with turn two, and hopefully close in there and see how this works a little bit better.